Well, hello, it's Alistair McGrath again. It's very good to be with you and to introduce my textbook, Theology the Basics. Now, this seventh presentation is all about the Holy Spirit. And this theological topic is covered in the sixth chapter of this textbook. And as many of you will know, one of the most important theological developments of the late 20th century is the rise of the charismatic movement. And the origins of this movement can be traced back right to the early years of the 20th century, especially the very famous Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles in 1906. And today, of course, the charismatic movement is a major influence in global Christianity and it affects most mainline Christian churches. And its emphasis on the role of the Holy Spirit in worship and the Christian life has given a much higher profile to theological reflections on the role of the Holy Spirit. Yet Christian theologians have always been aware of the importance of the Holy Spirit, even if recent developments have raised awareness of its significance. So in this presentation, we're looking at the area of theology known as pneumatology. Pneumatology, from the Greek word pneuma, meaning spirit, which talks about the importance of the Holy Spirit. So let's think about how we translate this word spirit. Now, the English language has to use at least three words, wind, breath, and spirit, to translate a single Hebrew word, ruach. And this word is used extensively in the Old Testament, and it has a depth of meaning it's virtually impossible to reproduce in English. And ruach is traditionally translated simply as spirit, but actually it has a range of meanings, and each of those meanings casts some light on the complex associations of the uh, Christian idea of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at three associations of this important biblical term. First of them, the idea of ruach as wind, wind. The Old Testament sees a parallel between the power of the wind and the power of God. And the image of the spirit as redemptive power, I think is best seen in the Exodus from Egypt, which speaks of a powerful wind dividing the waters of the Red Sea so that God could lead the people of Israel through as they left behind captivity in Egypt. And here the idea of Ruach conveys both the power and the redemptive purpose of God. To speak of God as spirit is to remind Israel of the power and the dynamism of the God who called Israel out of Egypt. Then we come to the second category, which is Ruach as breath, breath. And the idea of spirit is deeply associated with that of life. And in Genesis 2, we read of God breathing into Adam, the breath of life, as a result of which he became a living being. So we have here the idea of God breathing life into his creation. God is the one who breathes the breath of life into empty shells and brings them to life. And the famous vision of the valley of the dry bones, we find this in Ezekiel 37, also illustrates this point. Can these dry bones live? Well, the bones only come to life when breath enters them. And so thinking about God as spirit thus affirms that God is the one who creates and indeed recreates life. So we come to the third category, Ruach as inspiration. And this refers to the filling of someone with the Spirit of God for a specific purpose, such as, for example, inspiring a prophet to declare God's will to the people. And the point here is that a prophet's credentials rest upon an endowment with the Spirit. Think, for example, the prophet Micah, who spoke these words in the 8th century BC. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So how did Christian theologians develop these ideas? It's interesting to see that early patristic writers, in other words, early writers 
of the Christian faith were hesitant to speak openly of the Holy Spirit as divine or indeed speak about the Spirit as being God. Why? Because they did not think this was explicitly stated in Scripture. However, as they reflected more on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, it became clear that the full divinity of the Holy Spirit had to be recognized. For example, Gregory of Nazianza stressed that the Bible's use of the word holy to refer to the Spirit implied that the Spirit was something that sanctifies, that made holy, not something that itself needed to be sanctified, to be made holy. Do you see the point he's making? Let's look at another patristic writer, the theologian Didymus the Blind, who died towards the end of the 4th century. And Didymus and many other early Christian writers were clear that according to the Bible, the Spirit was responsible for the creating, renewing, and sanctifying of God's creatures. Yet, how could one creature renew or sanctify another creature? If the Holy Spirit performed functions which were specific to God, it must follow the Holy Spirit shares in the divine nature. So again, we see this pattern. What the Spirit does reflects what the Spirit is. Now, there's another point here, and that is the way in which the Spirit is referred to in the baptismal formula of the church. Let me explain to you what that is. In Matthew's Gospel, right at the end, the risen Christ commanded his disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that baptismal formula links together Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Athanasius of Alexandria argued that this formula established the closest of connections between the three members of the Trinity. It made it impossible to suggest the Father and Son alone were divine, whereas the Spirit was just a creature. So then, what does the Holy Spirit actually do? And many theologians try to provide brief summaries of the work of the Spirit. And a very good example is found in Basil of Caesarea's succinct statement from the 4th century. Listen to this. Through the Holy Spirit, we are restored to paradise, led back to the kingdom of heaven, adopted as children, given confidence to call God Father and to share in Christ's grace, called children of light and given a share in eternal glory. Now, I'll read that again so you can appreciate how rich this is. Through the Holy Spirit, we are restored to paradise, led back to the kingdom of heaven, adopted as children, given confidence to call God Father and to share in Christ's grace, called children of light, and given a share in eternal glory. So let's try unpack all of this. Christian theology has generally understood the work of the Holy Spirit to focus on four broad areas. Affirming God's active presence in the world, making God known to humanity through revelation, enabling us to take hold of Christ in salvation, and energizing the Christian life. So let's explore the Christian understanding of the role of the Spirit by reflecting on each of these four areas. First of all, God's active presence in the world. And a central theme of the person and work of the Holy Spirit relates to God's active presence and action in the world. The Spirit is seen as being active in the world, preparing hearts and minds for an encounter with God. And in his encyclical letter, Dominum et Vivicantum, which means the Lord and giver of life, John Paul II emphasized that the Holy Spirit is already present in the world, illuminating and informing minds. That's a very important statement of the Spirit's activity in the world. But secondly, the Spirit is also concerned with revealing God to humanity. 
and in the second century, Irenaeus wrote of the Holy Spirit through whom the prophets prophesied, and our forebears learned of God, and the righteous were led in the paths of justice. And the key point here is the Holy Spirit leads us into God's truth. Without that spirit, we cannot find that truth in all its fullness. And of course, this idea is also expressed in the inspiration of Scripture and the subsequent responsibility of the church to interpret and apply this text. And we are guided by the Spirit in this process of interpretation. So we come to the third area in which the Spirit plays an important theological role, and that is the appropriation of salvation. We've already noted how patristic writers justified the divinity of the Spirit with reference to the functions of the Spirit, and many of those functions relate specifically to the doctrine of salvation. For example, the Holy Spirit in, plays an important role in sanctification, in making holy. The Holy Spirit makes people holy. And the Holy Spirit here plays a critical role in illuminating, healing, and enabling humanity to take hold of Christ and thus to benefit from his identity and his work. Now, Protestant theologians of the 16th century placed particular emphasis on this point. For John Calvin, the Holy Spirit plays a major role in relation to the establishment of a living relationship between Christ and the believer. And a similar point is made in Catholic theology. For example, the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution and revelation affirms the critical role of the Spirit in preparing the human mind and the human heart for both revelation and salvation. And so we come to the fourth and final aspect, the energization of the Christian life. The Holy Spirit plays an especially important role in sustaining and upholding the Christian life, both individually and communally. And the 5th century writer Cyril of Alexandria is one of many to stress the role of the Spirit in bringing unity within the church. The Spirit enables the making real of God in personal and corporate worship and devotion. The Holy Spirit also leads believers uh, into a Christian life, particularly enabling them to be moral and to be spiritual. There's a lot more there that needs to be said, but I think it's good in this chapter to look at Christian imagery and the Holy Spirit. We haven't done that very much in earlier presentations, but it's especially appropriate in dealing with the Holy Spirit. Now, early Christianity developed a rich range of symbols as a way of expressing and representing its fundamental beliefs and values. One of those, of course, is the cross. For example, Christians were regularly baptized with the symbol of the cross as a sign of all that the gospel meant. And again, as many of you will know, churches and other Christian places of meeting did not merely include a cross. They were often built in the shape of a cross. And you may remember that we noted earlier how the symbol of a fish emerged as an important way of representing core Christian beliefs about the identity and significance of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit began to be linked with images around this time, particularly the symbol of a dove. Now, the gospel descriptions of the baptism of Jesus often make reference to a dove, for example, referring to the spirit descending like a dove on him, as you can see in this rather nice icon depicting the baptism of Christ. From the 5th century onwards, the image of a dove came to be used to represent the Holy Spirit, especially in the context of Christian baptism. But it's also used in other contexts. For example, the 1755 depiction of the Trinity shows each of the person of the Trinity individually. And it's interesting to note how the Holy Spirit is represented here. So that is a brief overview of some themes relating to the Holy Spirit. Again, there's so much more that could be said.
But let's just work through the structure of this chapter so that you can get more out of it as you read it through on your own. As you might expect, we begin by looking at biblical models of the Holy Spirit to enable you to gain a sense of the range of this idea in Scripture and hence in Christian theology. We then look at Irenaeus, who spent a lot of time thinking about the theological role of the Holy Spirit, and you'll find that quite interesting. We then look at a debate about the divinity of the Holy Spirit in the patristic period. And really, there's looking at the, the, the way in which the early church moved to the firm conclusion that it had to speak about the Holy Spirit as being divine. The reasons for that are really interesting. We then come to a debate, sometimes referred to as the filioque debate. That refers to the Nicene Creed, talking about the Spirit, in effect, proceeding from the Father and the Son. And that proved controversial. Then the next section deals with the function of the Spirit, and then we look at the symbol of the Spirit, a dove, we've touched on it already briefly, but also two others, fire and oil. Then we end, as always, with a text, in this case, with the Cambridge theologian Sarah Coakley's reflections on the role of the Holy Spirit in thinking about prayer. And as always, there is so much more that could be said about this topic, but I hope this short presentation gives you a useful framework to begin thinking about this area of Christian theology on your own. I look forward to speaking to you again soon, and we move on to look at the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, discussed in the seventh chapter of Theology of the Basics. We've talked about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, so we're now ready to move on and explore this rich doctrine of the Trinity in more detail. Thank you so much for listening.